morning all. Um, right, here we are, back up again. Just had a lovely breakfast. Just cooked a big fry up. Um, this is the second time I've been up here this morning. Um, I came up and did an intro um, with my new microphone. Um, <laughs> I ordered the microphone. It's taken about, I don't know. I don't know how long. I don't know how long anything is anymore. Everything seems like months ago, doesn't it, when it's only days ago. and Every day is just confusing. It all just melds into one. Um, but anyway, I'd ordered the new microphone because I was getting the problem with the hiss. I then found the anti-hiss button um, on the editing suite, so I wasn't getting a problem anymore. But anyway, the other day we heard some uh, barking. Uh, the gravel and the drive went. There was a bing bong on the door. They leave the parcels now, don't they, the parcel man, and run to the back of the, the drive and sort of wave or take a photo or something. Um, anyway, this happened. Right, here we are, at last. It's, what day is it today, Georgia? Friday. Friday, so only a day late. The new microphone, the end of the hiss. Um, and the end of me having to sort of filter on every single thing I film, hopefully. So here we go. It's like one of them what's in the box videos, isn't it? What's in the box? KNF concept. It's not as heavy and as manly as I thought it would be, but oh look, you get a picture of a camera, that's handy, so you know where to put it. Um, oh, it looks a bit posher than that rubbish one I have got. Even got a little digital readout of some description. Clip it to my belt. Something to, oh, something to clip it to. Hopefully there's something to clip it to that the top of the camera. That's receiver on the back. That's receiver, is it? Okay. Trans That's transmitter, so yeah. that must... Surely it's better than that. It must have a hot... Oh, there it is. Little hot shoe. That'll go on the camera. Somehow. Figure that out later. Where's the important bit? The microphone. I'm not as impressed at this stage as I thought I would be, I must admit. I thought it was going to look... Um, a little bit more amazing from the 130 quid. Wow. Um, looks exactly the same as the <laughs> one I've got. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> the worst is, the, the best thing is that the one I've got is about 20 years old and this one is about 20 seconds old. That's terrible, that little phone. Anyway, and you've got a black clip, whereas my other one's got a silver clip, and every time I film, I have to fill it in with a, uh, what they call them, pens, being? Sharpie. Sharpie. That's it. So there you go. So we'll find out tomorrow if it's any better or any worse. Nice one. Cheers. And the reality was as I thought. Uh, I'd spent extra money, like £100 more than this one, um, and it was awful. I mean, it was truly awful. Uh, I thought it looked poor, but it was worse than poor. So we're back on the old mic. I mean, like I say, now I've got the editing suite, that's not a problem. We had a, another slight issue. I had another slight issue. Um, <clears throat> if you notice on my YouTube list, there's two number, what were we last time? Number nines. Uh, and one's got little brackets and says no music. Um, a couple of people, New Zealand, for example. This gets watched all over the world. It's amazing. It's just so cool. Um, but I had a couple of mails from New Zealand, they couldn't watch it at all um, because the old video clips that have got music, soundtracks in, embedded into them, um, there's some sort of an algorithm or something that's built into YouTube there, uh, something to do with copyright, um, and they couldn't play it. So I had to re-edit the clips with the music on um, and put a voiceover. I quite like it, to be honest. Um, so there's two of those. One is if you can't view the one with music, click on the one without music and that'll play perfectly. Um, <clears throat> on the subject of music, um, so that this doesn't happen again, I spent most of yesterday going through today's um, old video clips and, and the rest of the old video clips. Taking, I can remove the soundtrack totally, do a voiceover, but I have managed to get some music that I can use um, from my son, Connor, Connor Lane. Um, who's got, uh, I think, about four albums, I think it's four, uh, released there on Spotify under Connor Lane, obviously. Um, now, his normal style um, is, if you know anything, he's a guitarist, if you know anything about guitarists, I'd sort of liken it to, if you know of, 
like Steve Vai, Joe Satriani. But if you imagine them after six weeks lockdown and they're very, very frustrated, that's the normal sort of way he plays. Uh, well, it's like this. I'll play you a bit, OK? So as you can hear, it's quite frantic. Good description, kind of. I like it. It's very good, uh, but it's quite loud. Um, but the track, he does this one track uh, called This Town. Um, which is a lot more sedate and sounds more like this. Track. So if I do need music at all, then I'll use that. And I know I can use it because, well, basically I spawned him and I can use anything of his I like. Um, so there we go. That's the, the music bit covered. So where were we? Anyway, <coughs> back to the story. Start with a couple. Sip of tea. We're at Horton still. It's the second year, halfway through the second year, sort of midsummer. The weed's gone ballistic, absolutely ballistic. And the Weedy Bay, of which I've spoke about a fair bit already, um, was just solid. It was unfishable. Uh, and the carp were spending a lot of time in there, obviously, because they were totally safe. It was just matted on the surface, all this weed. And you could see them tenting in there. And you just So me and Keith, anyway, we had this amazing idea we were going to rake a hole in the middle of the weed and we were going to absolutely batter them in there so that's what we done we got an old metal rake i think it was like two heads welded back to back or something we coppled up something or other um, <clears throat> and we didn't have a rope long enough so we got lots of different pieces of rope of different sizes and diameters and granny knotted them all together until we had you know i don't know 25 yards or whatever of rope so we've gone into the weedy bay um, <coughs> giving it the big and now it's gone badoosh in the middle of the way water going everywhere started putting I mean the first few pulls it took both of us you know as m full effort to even get it moving and we got in these huge huge like rafts of weed but the more we done it on the same spot the, the obviously the easier it got the less weed that was there and then you start to feel tink tink as the, the weed as the rake hits the bottom so I said, hold on, I'll, I'll shoot up the tree um, uh, and have a look at what's happening, you know, see the, what gap we've created and tell you left a bit, right a bit, further a bit. So anyway, I've gone up this little snapper on the side, hanging out the top, it's swaying about. And uh, Keith's got the rake ready to chuck it. And I've looked out, I've gone, whoa, 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 hold on. I said, there's two fish out there, thinking that they must have just that second turned up, you know, as we'd stopped and I'd climbed the tree. And they were sat out the back, just, just, I could see the clear hole that we'd made, like a great big clear hole with a big stripe coming towards where Keith was standing. And there was these two carp just sat out the back there. And I'm looking and thinking, if he chucks that rake, they're going to just spook, you know, is it fishable, what, what do we do? And it needed more clearing, so I said, they ain't going nowhere, Keith, just chuck it again. So he's, out it's gone, bird dosh, I was expecting them to go, the carp. But instead, they just stayed put. And another couple drifted in and sat with them. They weren't spooked in the slightest from the rake. They were interested, nosy, curious as to what was going on. And, you know, we carried on for an hour or so making this hole. And those carp stayed there the whole time. In fact, they, it grew in numbers. It was about half a dozen, I think, in the end, just watching what was going on. Just, I mean, only just out of range of where the rake was going in. Um, but yeah, so we created this clear hole, obviously. We thought this, we were going to make a killing in here. Uh, I don't think we ever had a bite off of it. We both had a go, you know, over the following few weeks. Um, I got close one day, I got a bait there, and what, what would happen? That They wouldn't breach the back of the weed once we'd cleared the hole. So that was the spot they were in, but they wouldn't go back there. They'd stay behind the weed. But one day a common made his way through. I had a rig down there, uh, and he just looked at that rig. He just literally sat there and looked at that rig for, I, I don't know, long, you know, hour, more. Just stared at it, just thinking, there ain't no way I'm picking that up. And eventually he, he swam off and, yeah, we never had a bite from that clear hole at all. Um, but luckily we were, we were getting bites from, you know, other areas around the lake. It was fishing quite well. Um, bear in mind, you know, we'd done this massive pre-baiting campaign and the fish were on our bait it was noticeable not by now the percentage of captures to to our bait compared to everybody else's um cp had still to catch i believe 
um, that I was catching quite well. Keith, Keith was getting a few. Um, Phil, PDT, Phil Doubles Thompson, he was getting his share of doubles. Um, he did get one night, he, get, he got one much, he always had the lady earlier on, but he got, I remember he had one day, he had a lovely fish, um, which he, I think he christened Son of Shoulders. It was a beautiful coloured fish with quite a big hump on its back, um, sort of a tan brown, lovely fish. Um, and it wasn't, at first we didn't realise, but when we looked at the photos, it was actually, if you cast your mind back, well, you don't have to, I'll ping a photo up, but my very first fish that I caught, I lost a big one on the first day, second day of the first year, and then the first one that I banked was that sort of white thing, real pale, bizarre-looking carp. It's the same carp. It turned out it had just coloured up nice, grown a bit to, I think, 26 when, when Phil had it. I think he might have had it twice, actually, 25 and 26. Um, and I've actually got a nice little bit of video of that, so I'm going to stick that up first. The red light means it's on, doesn't it, Phil? That's right, yeah. What was the weight? 26.4. So, a pound bigger than the last one. Nice to see. Very nice. Of shoulders. So yeah, like I say, you know, we called him PDT, but not all the fish he was catching were, were doubles. Um, in fact, he did hook um, the daddy of them all in what we used to call the RIP corner, which was sort of opposite the lodge. So just a little bit further up than the plateau and, and the spindly tree, which was the feature in the middle. So just past that in the in sort of far corner nearest Katie's house, nearest the pub. Um, it was the RIP corner and it was so called because originally when the fish came over from Longfield um, there was a fish known as Big Scale, um, very very famous old fish and unfortunately that died on the first year, just old age I think and it was found in that corner so that was became known as the RIP corner. Um, <coughs> yeah anyway Phil did hook shoulders in that corner and played it right out, got it close enough that it was plodding up and down the edge um, that you could see it was definitely 100% shoulders and then disaster struck and it, I can't remember what came off snapped, I, I can't remember the exact end of the story but he lost it, he lost the fish which obviously, you know, that's the one that everybody wants um, and he'd lost it so he was proper gutted about that but it sort of went on to, it got worse for Phil um, after he lost that. I think it was the same session, in fact I'm pretty sure it was the same session. Phil used to, like I told you about his gear, he's, he's sort of very old gear, and he used to have this FG Co, which if you've never heard of that, that's way, way back in the day, that was a tackle manufacturer, FG Co, and they used to make quite cheap and shoddy aluminium stuff, uh, amongst other bits. And anyway, he had this uh, front bank stick, uh, FG Co bank stick and it had a big thumb screw jobby on the side for the adjuster and for some reason he always used to hang his car keys on there um, probably just so he didn't lose them in the grass or whatever but fairly sensible sensible right up until this session where after he'd lost shoulders somebody we never found out exactly what had happened um, but somebody had walked around the lake a non-member someone had got in when he was obviously not in his swim, pinched his car keys, gone into the car park, he must have blibbed about until they found he had a Sierra at the time, nicked his car, I mean, totally blatant, you know. He had, to, he had two locked gates to get out, but the keys were on his key ring, or in his car, one or the other. Um, unlocked the gates <laughs> and driven out <laughs> and buggered off in his Sierra. It was gone. Um, I think eventually like a long time later it turned up the police found it it had been used for whatever skullduggery um but there was a story this this story sort of carried on because a few weeks later um you may or may not have heard 
some of this tale before if you've read I, I think some of it's in my book um, and it's definitely in his book Waiting for Waddle um, which is even rarer than that one but uh, a few weeks later Phil hooked a fish um, up the top end of the lake now there's a lot of uh, opinions as to what happened here now, and I can't remember all of it I wasn't on the lake at the time when he hooked it um, I got there shortly after the battle was lost but the long and short of it was he'd hooked this fish um, which he could not stop um, and he would played it and played it from the bank for hours I don't know, we're talking hours Various people had come round and given him loads of advice, do this, do that. Phil don't need advice, but um, no, they give it anyway. I think, I'm not sure, I think someone like Richie McDonald or someone was there as well at the time, somebody. Um, anyway, there was all this to it, and he's played this fish for hours and hours and nothing was happening. We're talking four or five hours. Um, can't make any headway on it. So eventually someone's gone and got the boat, and they've gone out in the boat, and they've played it for that amount of time again you know so now we're talking eight nine whatever it was basically all day they've played this fish um, and Phil can't make any headway oh I've got my own um, opinions of, of what might have happened I think something else was involved as in maybe the fish had gone round a sunken waterlogged log so the, the weight you know like the, the mass of the weight was this whatever the fish was towing about behind it um, but the fish was definitely involved because it was towing the boat all over the lake up down up down and they could never bring it any higher I say they because eventually other people started to have a go Phil was knackered you know and he'd give the rod to someone they'd have a pull give it back to Phil eventually I think Phil knew that it, it, it was never going to happen uh, but he didn't want to pull too hard and pull for a break and he gave the rod to another one of the anglers Nutty Jeff um, and he gave it the big heave ho and the line went eventually um, and it became known as Phil's monster um, but the story that linked to the car was obviously everyone then said that what he'd actually hooked was shoulders that he'd lost driving his car that he'd lost uh, and that was why he couldn't get it off the bottom because shoulders was down there in an old Sierra pottery around the bottom with the, the rig hooked to the bumper but uh, it could have been who knows who knows but somehow I doubt it It was around this time as well that um, CP actually opened his account. He had his first one on the bait. He was fishing down by the uh, little jetty where we moored the boat, right by the lodge. <coughs> in fact, if memory serves correctly, for some reason, he was, I don't know if he was staying in the lodge or outside the lodge. I know he was at the lodge a lot. Um, and there was a little spot under the jetty. Phil had started, actually, Phil Thompson. He, he'd been baiting off the jetty, and, and eventually it got eaten, and there was like a little clear spot down there. And there wasn't so much a swim there. The plateau was the first swim, but there was a little gap. Um, and if you was sat on the lodge steps, or we had a sofa outside the lodge as well in the summer with the doors wide open. And I think CP was in sort of that plot, if you like, with his rods down in this little gap, fishing out under the jetty. Um, and he had his first fish. I think he had two, actually, um, both mid-20s. Um, obviously, he was over the moon. I was there when he had his first one. I see him playing a fish, and I went charging round there. Um, well, Fat Sam went charging round there. I went wandering round there, and she's in, he's, he's having a bit of a panic trying to land it, and he see Fat Sam in the swim, and he's like, where's your dad, where's your dad? Um, and then I come in behind and scooped it up. Uh, so he'd opened his account. Um, and there was fish coming out from all around the lake, really dotted about. Um, and I think it was then that Reg had the wood carving, which is an amazing fish, you know, absolutely beautiful fish. I tried to show you the pictures when Keith had it, but they weren't very good pictures, to be honest. But I've got a bit of video of Reg with the wood carving on the bank, and you really can see what I'm talking about in this video. So we're going to have a look at that right now. So there we go, Reg Bampton with the wood carving, which, you know, let's face it, in today's world on most waters would be what? A 21 and a half pound linear. But uh, back then on Horton, uh, and even now on Horton, it was one of the main target fish. And, and you can see why. I mean, look at it. 
it is jet black on the top. It's got those beautiful scales. They're so sort of deep set, set right into its flanks. It's an absolute perla. It's amazing. And it's still alive now. It's swimming around in Horton as you're watching this, paddling up and down there in that gin clear water. 40 pounder. That's amazing. Old as the hills. And there we go. This is a, a Obviously the celebration must have been a little bit too early in the day for the usual um, cold Cronenbergs. That's me and Reg doing a huge fry up for all in attendance, especially for Sam McCurry is going up there. She's watching every sausage. Oh, the girls just have the wok instead. Do the washing up for you. I wonder how much of that breakfast actually ended up down her gut. So there we go. Those sort of breakfasts um, were almost as legendary as our alcohol fueled parties. Um, if there was ever three, four, five people about, we'd all have breakfast together on the bank. Um, like I mentioned before, we used to have afternoon picnics as well. It was very, very sociable lake. Um, but everyone would bring their cookers around to whatever was the biggest swim in the middle of where everyone was. And we'd get, you know, three or four woks and frying pans and everybody would throw all their breakfast stuff in, in the kitty. Um, and we'd have these massive extravaganza breakfasts. They, they really were amazing. I, I do remember one actually in particular. We were just all getting ready for breakfast. It was in the ski slope. Um, now the ski slope was named the ski slope because it, it was a proper slope and when it rained it was treacherous and as such a couple of little steps got dug into it um, and we were just sort of arranging ourselves. It was CP was in the swim, he, he was fishing that swim at the time and I'll never forget. Um, I've com come in and I've gone to sit down on one of these grass steps cut in the sort of grass and mud and that and I've put my hands behind me like you would to lower yourself down um, but the step was higher than I thought so I was halfway through plonking myself down and I had my fingers straight down like that and I've somehow managed to <laughs> sort of sit on my own fingers as I've hit this step that's, that's come up a lot quicker than I thought and I actually snapped my middle finger clean across the knuckle joint, so where you've got the, the ball and joint, if you like, I'd snap the side off of the joint. Um, so my finger was at a god awful angle coming out like this. I thought I'd just sprained it or dislocated and tried putting it back in position. Christ, it hurt. Um, and it's still, I mean, you won't see from over there, but that middle knuckle is twice as big now, 20 years later, as it should be. It was huge for years afterwards. Um, yeah, so I managed to break my hand sitting down to breakfast. That's me in disasters. If there's an accident to be had, I'm having the accident. That's just the way I am. So anyway, this particular morning, um, what had occurred, he'd woken up, normal slugs all over everything, stuck the kettle on, put his hand under the bed, pulled out the orange juice, just give it a little squeeze so that the soggy spout opened, giving it glug, 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 glug. <coughs> Before he knows what's happened, he swallowed it. And he said all he felt was this wet, bouncy lump, big lump of matter um, that had been washed straight in his mouth with a big slug of orange juice, hit the back of his throat, instant reaction, swallow it. And then he's looked at the orange juice, and there's the telltale trial of a slug going up the side. <laughs> and in in the early hours, it's gone up his orange juice, over the spout, and fallen inside. And he's just sw swallowed whole. Oh, excuse me, he's sick then. Swallowed whole one of these great big ginger slugs. Oh, <laughs> just rank, isn't it? Absolutely rank. But uh, anyway, where was I going with this story? I was telling the story about all these. Oh, the salt circle. That was it. I knew there was a reason. There's always a reason. It's just getting back on track, isn't it? Um, so Wiggy, who was scared of earwigs, obviously was scared of... Uh, scared, didn't like all, all sorts of insects. He'd got this thing, I think he told me one day about... Yeah, he thought earwigs actually sort of went in your ear and burrowed into your brain or whatever, but regardless, um, didn't like insects and had been told, and rightly so, this is a deterrent for slugs especially, that they won't cross a line of salt. So he'd set up his bivvy and then he'd got probably gone to the shop especially to get it, got a bit, or maybe he carried them around with him all the time, I don't know. 
um, but he'd got a load of salt uh, and he'd put a circle of salt all the way around his entire camp. Um, but salt, salt and grass don't really get on. And what he had done, it had scorched a, a circle in the grass into the earth and it never grew back. Um, consequently, there was the salt circle um, and the swim became known as the salt circle. So we go back, back to where the story was originally going. See, we get there. We do get there in the end. Um, so CP had gone round to the sort of circle, uh, I think, with the, the sole intention of blasting him as far as he could over into my swim on the reach, which was quite a chuck. Um, as it happens, there was fish over there as well, showing fairly close in, um, that he noticed when he got round there. So he ended up fishing. There was a big line of weed, like visible weed. Um, and he ended up fishing over the back of that. And up till this time, I'm fairly certain that that swim had never done a bite. Pretty sure. I think I read that somewhere, probably in my own book. Um, but I'm fairly sure that that swim hadn't done a bite. And it hadn't been fished for quite a while because of this massive, visible weed bed there. Um, but he chucked them over the back and he said they went down with a donk and he, and he was happy with them. And I'm opposite in the reeds. So anyway, later that day, um, I've looked over uh, and I can see him bent into a fish um, and he looks like he's having a right old job with it you know he's heaving and heaving and I watched for a couple of minutes and I thought I'll go around and give him a hand uh, like I say up to this point he'd only had um, the two fish off the jetty that year uh, desperate for him to get a big one and it looked like it was going to be a big and he was having a proper battle royal with it so I mean, in fact Sam charged all the way around there stood with him like now for a little while he's trying to get it through the weed it's not coming in it became quite obvious quite quickly that we were going to need to punt the boat so I, the lodge is just like I say 100 yards away so I ran up there now this the, the boat is it was a punt actually it was about 14 foot long I suppose bloody great thing so I've got in the whatever it's called the sharp end the prow we've just one all and trying to you know got this 14 foot boat wiggling around behind me I've managed to get it round into his swim I've got him to jump in. Now, I don't know whether you've ever played a fish from a boat or not, but there's a couple of sort of rules, dynamics that you have to follow, otherwise you're wasting your time. You can't pull sideways off the side of a boat. It's pointless. All you do, because you're not on firm ground, you're in a boat. As you pull, all you do is spin the boat, and you pull the other way, you spin the boat the other way, and it just becomes futile. So the only way to play a fish is straight off the middle of the front of the boat off the pointy end um, so I got him to stand behind me in sort of the middle of the boat and I, I went and knelt right in the, in the sharp bit um, lines coming over we've got to the first weed bed and I've just like grabbed the line followed it down into the weed broken all the weed off you know until I've managed to ping the line up and said yep you're free and then he's wound down and, and carried on playing it and he's chugged down he's, he's you know we're just following the line now he's not feeding the fish at all it's really weedy got to the next clump of weed, I've done the same, broken the weed off, pulled the line free, yep, yep, you're in, again, and again, and again, and again. Uh, eventually we got to a huge bit of weed, uh, and he, he's feeling, you know, dunk, 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 now, so, you know, we know we're near enough over the top of it. So I've got in there and breaking the weed apart. Uh, eventually, I, you know, the rod started bouncing and he's in direct contact. So he's chugged them out a little bit. He's still got loads of weed on the fish, like tons of it. Uh, he's, he's come up and he's come up, and then this big weed bed, like a big green octopus, has sort of hit the surface, all like wallowing, and, and you can see like tail pattern coming out the back. So I've got the net, fed the net down, best as I could, seeing where the fish was. I said, right, okay, and we've just sort of half pulled, half hand lined the whole lot into the net pulled it all in, weed all hanging out the sides, weighed a ton, started breaking it apart um, and there's this huge, huge slab of mirror carp in there, um, a sea piece over the moon, obviously over the moon, so we got it in the boat, got it back to the bank um, and it's glorious, it was, well I won't tell you what it is, let's have a look at the video because I think I've got video of pretty much everything after that. Back to the 90s for us.
up she comes. 36 pounds 12 ounces turned out that fish was and would very shortly become known as CPs and forevermore. Beautiful carp, proper grower. We did trace it back to you know a, a much earlier capture at a smaller weight. Um, it might have come out a couple of times in its, in its 20s but it shot up to this weight. CP was over the moon with it. Actually, there, there is an end to the story with the boat that I forgot to put in um, when I'd been on the front ripping all the weed off the line and that and doing quite a lot to, to get this fish into the net. Um, and as it rolled into the net, he's grabbed hold of me, pulled me towards him and actually kissed me. <laughs> Enjoy it. Instantly realised what he's done. Spat in the lake. Uh, and scrubbed his mouth with the back of his hand and looked horrified with himself to be honest. Bless him. I don't mind a big sloppy kiss from CP. But uh, yeah, like I say, this was the carp. Oh, yeah. Who's that coming in? Don't know who that is. Somebody warned me. I might like Jeff actually. Jeffrey Tencast, that's what we called him. I'd forgotten about Jeffrey Tencasts. Bet you can't guess why we called him that. Anyway, that's CPs. Let's see him go back and let's move on. And there he goes, back to his watery home. CPs had a chance to chuck the old mainline t shirt on there. Look, good boy. What a result, eh? <laughs> he was so chuffed. <laughs> I was chuffed. Everyone was chuffed for him. They really were. Um, as a result, after that, the salt circle swim became quite popular. It had come from not being, you know, up there at all, you know, last choice sort of thing, uh, to being quite a popular swim. I could, I could sort of never get in there. Um, I was, I was catching from other areas. I was catching quite a lot of commons at this stage. I don't, I don't know why. Um, every time, I, every time I had something, it was a common. I was doing a lot of short, like in a swim, cast on a fish, get a bite, move, that sort of style of fishing. Not really stalking, but just, just very, very mobile. Um, and I was, was getting a lot of commons, a lot of them the lower end, you know, 18 to 22, 23. But I did have one um, very, very spectacular common, which was the PB common. Um, and I believe it was also a PB for me. Bizarre, that fish, you know, it, there was other fish of a similar size common. But it, like I said before, that was just that's the reason it's called the PB common. It was everybody's personal best. Um, and I did manage to get that recorded. Um, on video, so we'll watch that. But a word of warning, you might need some sort of um, sunglasses for my jumper. There he comes, the PB common. My PB as well, everybody's PB. Bizarre, really. Beautiful fish though, real long, proper powerful fish. And talking of beautiful, look at that jumper. Huh? Is that or is that not a complete and utter work of art? I don't know what Christmas somebody bought that or what auntie bought it for me, but that's 100% a Christmas jumper. Isn't it? It's about every colour you can get. And there he goes. Pack off the impromptu homemade anukin mat into the church bay there. It's the mouth of the church bay swim there. Oh, they were good days. Tad on, mate. Tad on. I'm not sure, but I believe that that, that common may have been um, my sort of September biggie, if you like. As I've said over and over, September is my favourite month. Um, and I did have a few fish in September. I believe that was one of them. Um, he fished quite well in September. Um, Robbie, little Robbie. Um, he hadn't caught much up until this stage, but he started catching. Uh, he had a lovely common. I've got a great photo of him mopping it up now. Um, happy face, happy angler with the common. He wasn't often that happy, Robbie, to be honest. He was quite, uh, could be quite a grumpy little fellow, let's just say that. Always got this image of Robbie walking around the lake. He, Keith brought it up the other day, and as soon as he said it, I thought, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten that. He'd wear um, a one-piece suit, like a green 
um, not one of them Nash ones, I think, the sort of quilted suit. Um, and what do they call those boots? Uh, rigger boots. You know what the lorry drivers wear? They sort of come up to about here, very, very loose, steel toe cap. Uh, that was what he wore. Even if it was scorching hot, you know, you go around to his swim tum, it'd be 25 degrees and be in there with the door shut and the kettle on and a one-piece suit and these, uh, these rigger boots on. That was, that was his attire. Um, but yeah, 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 there was a few fish out um, dotted about. CP had another really nice one off of the salt circle. Uh, he managed to get back in there and he had a fish, which I believe was the long one. As I said on the last episode, I get a bit confused. There was two. There was long, the long one and no name. I caught them both, but I can never remember which one is which, and I can't remember which one it is in this bit of video, but I do believe it's the long one. 26.12. Excellent. Other side? Yep. I checked the photo in the lodge, it's definitely the fish crew. So anyway, September came and went, um, and into October. Now, the previous year it died off pretty quick, the lake, but um, this October, for me, was going to be something absolutely special. I'd started, uh, beginning of October, it got quite cold, quite quick, quite miserable, um, and I'd started bringing the, the dome tent, the aqua dome tent. Funnily enough, if you remember when I was talking about last winter, there was only me and Keith that got these aquadomes. Um, and then I think Reg got one, CP got one, I think Robbie got... They just sprung up. It was like a, a mushrooms, just the multiplying. Um, the whole lake was just covered in these aquadomes because they had the no condensation. They had this cotton inner, um, so they were really comfy. And I'd started bringing mine about October, you know, second week of October or whatever. Uh, and I remember one particular week I was set up in the ski slope. Ski slope it keeps coming up ski slope. It was a very, very good swim. So you've got the church bay round to your right. And as they come out into open water, that's sort of where you can pick them off. Uh, all sorts of ranges, sometimes, you, you know, 40 yards, but quite often out there on that middle strip right in front of the swim. And I got in there and I'd got all settled up and, and I was moving less. You know, I bought the dome with the intention of doing going for two nights and fishing two nights there, going for two nights, because I knew the fish would be out there in that sort of central section come October, if, if, if there was going to be any bites, it was usually going to be from that area. So I got in there, and I remember I put a lot of bait out there, I chucked and chucked and chucked about in the weeds and found two lovely spots, I put, put quite a lot of bait out there. Um, I was lying there in bed, you know, it was light, but it was cold, and I was still all snuggled up in bed. Now Fat Sam, she had her own bed, most of the time she used to sleep under a bush. She was quite wild, a bit like Maddie, the dog I've got now. But this particular morning, I remember I was woken up by her clawing at, at the sleeping bag, which was really unusual. Um, and we used to have these big multicoloured Argos sleeping bags at the time. And I've just lifted up the side like that. Whew, she shot straight in. Gone down in the bag, which she never used to do. She must have been cold, curled up down by my feet. She was buffing and thrashing about, but eventually she found her little spot. And she's gone to sleep, and I'm trying to get back to sleep. And I've got beep, 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 and the bobbins drop down. And I've sort of looked out, and thought, oh, God, and there's about 500 tufties out there just mullering my bait. They're just diving down, picking up the boilies. As they're coming up, the seagulls are all swooping in and attacking them, and it's this, just like an avery out there. I thought, oh, God, I ain't putting up with this. I want to go back to sleep. So left the dog in the bag, got out, wound in this, one rod, the other one was on, on the other spot, didn't seem too bad. Wound it in, looked at the boil, if all that would do. And I've just luzzed it right out to the left as far as I possibly can, which ain't far, I weren't using big leads. But I've just whacked it out there, donk it at the bottom, um, put it down in the rest, stuck the bobbin on, loosened the clutch, got back in bed, pulled the sleeping bag over me and thought, sod it, you know. They're not feeding, I ain't going to get a bite, but I'm not sitting here being mullered by tufties the whole time. So yeah, I've dropped off to sleep. I couldn't have been asleep very long at all, 10 minutes or whatever. 
I've got an absolute one note. I've just had it's going. I think I was using the little Stevie Nevels at the time, which are piercing. Uh, it's absolutely screaming. So I've leapt up the bag, the zip on the bag's all clonked and ding, and I can't get out. So I've thrown my legs off the bag, forgetting I've got the dog in there. Uh, thrown my legs out with the sleeping bag and the dog. Um, the dog's gone bosh on the floor inside the bottom of the sleeping bag. I've jumped straight out on top of her. She's squirming and howling and barking and whatever in the bottom, protesting. Um, and I've managed to drag myself out of the bag and I've hooked into this fish. Jesus Christ. Um, like I said, I hooked it at range, but wow, it just fought like mental. Absolutely like mental. Uh, ploughed about all over the swim. Uh, took loads of line to start with, kited right down towards the reeds, came back, went back out where, where it started from, then went back, back to the right, tried to get in the bay. Proper, proper scrap, this fish. CP's turned up just out of nowhere, just in time. He's gone down the front, got the net, gone down the little steppy bit. Um, in it's gone, it's gone. It's a monster, guys. It is a monster. We've looked in there and we're like, it is huge. Um, got all the mat and everything, dragged it out, put it on the mat, and we've recognised it as Lumpy. Now, Lumpy was the original um, road lake fish. So they've come from the road lake and from Goose Pool, from Longfield. The original road lake fish hadn't been out, thought it hadn't been out for a long, long time. As it turns out, it had. But I've got some great video, so we're going to watch that before I tell you too much. You had the run at quarter to nine in the morning, didn't you? From the reeds. 14th of the 10th, 92. Hell of a fight, wasn't it, Dave? Oh, yes. Hell of a One and a half. Again. Forty one. Yeah, forty one twelve. Yeah. Good enough for me. <laughs> so it was about this time, or thereabouts, that we realised um, our huge, huge mistake. The fish got recognised as do you remember way back when Keith caught that one after the Eubank fight? Twenty five pound ten ounces and everyone thought it was considerably bigger. Well, it was. It was this one. Uh, we worked it out, plus the revolution of the scales, um, that it was 33.10 when he had it, and here it was a year later, 41 pound, 12 ounces. Um, amazing. Just an absolute stunning fish. How we could have ever thought, even with the you know slightly lesser weight, how we could have thought that was 25 pound, I don't know at all. I don't know whether to blame copious amounts of Guinness or uh, Chris Eubank really but either way we'd made a momentous cock up that day but this time we were certain it was lumpy king of the old road lake 41 pounds 12 ounces so <laughs> yeah all in all it'd all been a bit of a cock up where Keith was concerned but I was well happy I'd got myself another 40 pound I mean at this time um, Horton had properly come on. You know, the fish had grown. You've got now, you've got Lumpy at 40 pound. Uh, Shoulders was doing 40 pound. The Parrot had done 40 pound. Jack was over 40 pound. So you've got four different 40 pounders in one lake in the UK in 1992. You know, that's like, forget about four 40 pounders. No, don't get an image in your head of a lake that you know that's got five 40 pounders in there. 1992 we're talking about. This is major, absolute major league. Um, yeah, it was proper on form, but it wasn't just the carp in there as well. There was a hand, not even a handful, two or three very, very large pike in there. Um, and after I'd caught Lumpy, um, that was pretty much the end of it. I'm not even sure if any more carp were caught until the other, the back end of the winter, sort of March time after that. Um, but I did do a little bit of pike fishing um, and I got a great bit of video. So again, 
We're going to go back um, and I'll show you a bit of pike fishing in the 90s on haul. Oh, this lane's into a chunk of a pike. Better land it. It's just actually tile water. How big do you reckon that is? It's about this big, and the rest, did it? I just saw the end of it. Turn it off, then. I just paused it while I moved round to get a better view. Fancy missing that. Really, yeah, I know, I saw it myself. <laughs> Just didn't get it on camera. Yes, oh, I like this a lot. Fucking awesome. How big? Big, big. <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's Is there a pike competition at your tackle shop today? <laughs> I think he was 21 pounds. I caught him three times. Uh, the largest I caught him was 32 pounds on the last year. Uh, and the guy, Ian Welsh, who was running the syndicate at the time, um, he was he was bike angler and he was desperate to catch it. So I nicknamed it Thicky, um, just to take the piss really, because he couldn't catch it. And I'd caught it three times and I'd only pike fished three times, literally three times, and I had it three times. Fought like mental every time. Unfortunately, it it killed itself. Um, it choked on a coot. Um, it was found, it, it's in floating in the middle. Someone went out in the boat and pulled it out and it had two coot's feet sticking out of its throat, got them jammed in it, in it or sticking out of its mouth. Got this coot jammed in its throat, but so he never did catch it. Um, so there we go. Oh, by the way, just before that clip, you heard some horrible buzzing. It's not my microphone. I don't, I'm, unsure yet because I haven't been down to edit but next door seems to be drilling holes in everything he's that bored uh, he's got a shed out there and he's just forever drilling and cutting and chopping stuff but there you go um, so yeah that was like I say that was pretty much um, the end of the carp fishing I had that pike at 21 pound um, and we just sort of moved into our normal winter mode um, big roast dinners in the lodge. We'd, it, it got out of hand now. They were like extravaganza. There was like a restaurant in there every night in the winter. It was great. And we were all looking forward to our end of year party, which I have mentioned before. Um, we'd planned this, this great big party for the end of the year. 
uh, which we'll get on to. I'm, I'm actually going to leave you with a little bit of that. But before, before we get to that, um, I'd just like to quickly say about the books. Quite a few of you all the books. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, the post, I might have said this before in the last one, but the post at the moment is all over the place. Um, I, you know, it's supposed to take three days, some are taking three, some are taking three days, some are taking four, five or six, it's just, it's out of my hands, once it's posted, you do an order, I post it the next day, um, and, and it is coming to you, so don't worry, if you are interested in a book, um, I've got the link below, if you scroll down after this, you'll see a little link there, you know, a sort of web address, um, that should be live this week, I made a bit of a cock up last week, but if you just press it, that should take you to my uh, website and there's just two tabs there by flick of the tail or by fine lines it's really simple as long as you've got paypal if you haven't got paypal the contact at the bottom of my web of my website page um it's got my email address just ping me an email and we do some sort of you know bank transfer or whatever so that's that so end of this week before we go i am going to leave you with my um <laughs> my little uh, what do you call it when you put loads of the collage if you like video collage of um, the party the end of season party in Horton Lodge I've had to cut a lot out uh, it was very long anyway to be honest but I put a few of the sort of main players bits in there uh, just in case you don't get the drift of it what it was throughout the day we'd come up someone had come up with a plan that we'd write little poems about other anglers uh, odes really like little five line six line poems and on the night everybody would have to read their own one yeah so not the one you've written but the one that's written about you so three or four of them might have written a poem about me i had to stand up on the table and read what they'd written which made it all the more amusing uh, I, I was chopping this up in into this collage thing last night I was in stitches I was absolutely in stitches like I say some of it I had to take out um, just wasn't for public viewing but uh, hopefully you'll find it as funny as I do anyway so on that note um, until next week I'll leave you with the Horton Lodge party here's uh, my poem we're all reading our own poems this is my poem here comes Thompson <laughs> and his bald head I look alike from right said Fred bubbles are all that he will catch I'm his snatch <laughs> My ambition is taking pot and to keep all little air he's got. Yeah, that's really good, very really good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. The rave. Yeah, Hot dog. You're all right. We're dragging you up there. Holding you up there. Do you know not have the rubber tree? You better be. Okay. Hot oh. recital, take two. They all call you a spawny git, but you just couldn't give a shit. The drugs have really got you going, they've made your nose red and glowing. <laughs> Sam sack sucks you off five times a night. That's why you think she's out of sight. Respect is true. <laughs> 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 I can't read. <laughs> the props have really let you down. At times they made you look a clown. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to be serious. <laughs> Your ears are simply far too big. <laughs> the, other, the other anglers just have a dig. I ain't noticed that. <laughs> a Milton pulls you may have caught, but for a cart you have not fought. Yeah. yeah. Season, you've been Horton's blanker, or are you just a skinny wanker? <laughs> <laughs>
John! Don't stand on the table, John. John. No, 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 no. Mind that soon. I'm on the table. It's oh, we are. <laughs> right. Sid. Johnny. Right. Right. <laughs> right. John. John. <laughs> It was a smasher. so long beside the lake, but you'll never ever get a title. With your tash and bright, bright gear, you look just like, a... just like a northern queer. <laughs> when you caught Lumpy, your scales did lie. Now some Rubens you need to buy. Frequently you eat a curry, then to the bog you must hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Dungeoneer! Richard is a dungeon master. <laughs> oh, good rock, good rock. Yeah, hear yeah, the whip cracker boy. <laughs> Richard is a dungeoneer, he always take out the rear. He cannot drink all that, that much beer. Maybe it's because he's a queer. He hasn't caught a haul in 30, but they will always do him dirty. <laughs> Sadly, I'm not going to do it. 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 I'm not going